Well, good morning everybody and welcome to another Bushcraft Live um, Forest Skills. We, it's Monday morning, so it's taken quite a lot of effort to get set up this morning. You know what Mondays are like, but um, the weather seems to be holding for me. I'd, I'd worried a little bit last night that it was going to rain um, this morning, but the sky's pulled away, so I'm risking it. I haven't even set up a tarp um, because I'm fairly confident I'm going to get half an hour before my laptop and the camera get wet. But anyway, welcome to everybody. We'll do the usual five minutes of a um, few questions uh, and a few shout outs just while everybody filters in and the numbers um, people start joining us over the next five minutes. So welcome to, I've got to say welcome to Paru Ram because um, I'm not sure if you're a girl or a boy, but um, welcome to you because you're a diehard, you're there every day. So uh, wherever you are, welcome. And uh, Thomas Haig, Morning Ed. Well, I mean, I'm a little bit better looking than him. I thought you might be able to tell the difference by now, but um, I'm not Ed, I'm Stephen. Uh, but nice, nice to meet you anyway. And where is Ed? Where is Ed? Well, he's not here. <laughs> I'm doing the cooking this morning. Ed will be on, on Wednesday. Ed will be with you on Wednesday. We had a bit of a chat, Ed, over the week, Ed and I, over the weekend, and he's... He's ended up with um, having to take a, a, a job and I've had to take a little bit of a job. Lockdown's been a bit strange for us because we've had uh, a lot of our work cancelled. But uh, starting this coming week, both of us have got a little bit of work we'll have to do. So we're going to reduce the sessions down to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, but it means we'll probably be able to put a little bit more effort into the sessions and do even more interesting stuff. So Ed will be with you on Wednesday. Hello from West Linton, Logan Mackay. I used to live in West Linton, well not quite West Linton, I used to live in Carlops, just along the road, so not far from where you are. Uh, so welcome to you. Uh, can you say hi to Maria and Jim in Yorkshire? Hello to you guys. Tristan, I can't see the screen that well, Mc, McFina, McF, McFinna. Hi Stephen, morning Stephen from Sarah and Edith. Um, morning from Horsham, Vissy or Vi Vissy, Vice. Thomas Haig, sorry Stephen, oh, you're, you're, uh, don't worry about it, it's not a problem. Like I say, with my hat on, maybe you could confuse us, although I'm a little bit smaller than him. Um, good morning, Theo Newark, ready to go. Morning from Astley. And question from Leon Wheaton, what's your favorite thing about bushcraft? Probably two things, probably as an activity, cooking around a fire actually, which is what I'm going to be doing this morning, is probably one of my favorite things to do. And in terms of subjects, I would say animal tracking is probably my favourite thing. To be able to read the tracks and signs that animals leave behind in the woods is probably my favourite subject. And Amy and Joel say hi from em Empsey. Morning from Astley. Um, morning. Uh, so Mariam, Khadija and Abdullah in London. You've also joined us a few times, so thanks for sticking with us. I hope you're well. And uh, hi, Stephen, love, Sonny, or Sonny. And can William have a shout out? Yes, you can. Shout out to William. Morning, Stephen, from Corey and Hayden. Hi to you guys. Okay, we'll do a few more shout outs at the end, but I think we'll get started because about half an hour ago, I lit my fire and uh, just to try and get the timing perfect so that I'm cooking on this fire when it's just right. And you can see there's not a lot of smoke coming from this fire now. And what that tells me is my fire has burned down to embers and it's great for cooking on. So I'm not going to mess around. I'm going to get on with it. Now, usual disclaimers. Um, what you're going to see me demonstrate here is various techniques in bushcraft. So we are going to be cooking on fires and we are going to be using a knife for a small amount of woodwork. So if you're a child, please make sure you have adult supervision at all times during all of these things. Um, there are some inherent dangers with cooking on fires and also using knives, but I'll do my best um, to make sure you get all the safety points to make sure you'll have no problems whatsoever. But a little bit of common sense and certainly some adult supervision. Also check out some of our other earlier videos where I've also covered lots of different safety techniques. And these videos are kind of building a little bit, so you'd be quite wise to watch some of those and make sure that you get all of the instruction that you need. Anyway, so what I'm basically going to do this morning is cook my breakfast. We can and cook on a fire, and sometimes it can feel like a real effort. Oh, you know, we've got the oven, we've got the gas inside, we can do everything nice and easily. And we really, uh, as a family, as I say, we force ourselves to try and get out as much as we possibly can. So here I am, I'm going to cook my breakfast. So I'm going, it's Veganuary, so I'm going to cook a vegan breakfast wrap, and I'm going to make the wrap too. 
So I think what I'll do is, one of the secrets to outdoor cooking I always think is make sure that you do all your preparation, um, as much of your preparation as you can before you start cooking on the fire. Because when you're cooking on a fire, it's not like cooking at home, um, you know, on a gas, where you have all these different controls. There's uh, lots of variables when cooking on a fire, and it takes quite a lot of skill to be able to get the timing just right. So what you don't want to be doing is trying to cook at the same time as doing another activity. So do as much of the prep as you can beforehand. So I'm going to make my own wrap. Now, I made one about an hour ago, now, so it's gone a little bit dry. But that's what we're going to try and aim to make. I've made my own tortilla. And I don't know if you can see that really easily, but there are lots of lovely bubbles in it. And that's exactly what we're after. And this is so easy to make. I want to show you how easy it is to make breadstuffs on the fire. So, again, because we don't have lots of time, we try and keep this to half an hour. I've made the dough already, but I can't stress enough how easy this is. This is flour and water and nothing else. So plain flour. Now, you can see this is going to make one wrap. And uh, you can see that it's about a handful of flour. And I think that's a good general guide. Whenever you're cooking outside, um, when you're cooking bread stuffs or when you're cooking bannock or when you're cooking something like this, we tend to use our hands as a gauge. Because when you're outside, you often don't have lots of measuring things. So what I've done here is, for me, I'm an adult, I've got fairly large hands. So one big handful of plain flour just went into the mixing bowl. So you can do that now if you're joining me. Um, and that just went straight in there. Now, obviously, if you're a child doing this, you've got smaller hands, you might want to add a little bit more flour, but you have to get used to being able to judge the quantities. Now, I put my plain flour in the bowl and then I added a little bit of water, just a little bit to start with. You can always add more water, but what you don't want to do is add too much water because then if your dough goes very sloppy, you'll have to add more flour to bring it back to the consistency you want. And this thing will just get bigger and bigger. So dough go, uh, flour goes in and then a little bit of water and start to bring it together and start to use your hands. You don't need a spoon for this. Get in there with your hands and start to bring it together. And then if you need a little bit more water, you add it. And basically the consistency you're going for is Play-Doh. So you can see here, I can scrunch it really easily in my hand and uh, it's nice and soft, but it's not sticky. It's not sticking to my hands. You can see that it's just dry enough. And what that means is I'll be able to roll this out quite easily and it'll be easy to manage. So that's the dough that you're after. Now, again, that size, again, roughly, you're looking at, I'd say that's the size of a, a satsuma. That's about the size that you want per person. Now, I've, I'm doing this all outside. So here's my chopping board. Now, I want to roll this into a circle. So if you want to roll something into a circle, start with a circle. Don't start with a splodge that looks like this and try and roll that into the round because it'll be very difficult. So just take a minute to bring the dough together and make it into a ball. Now I'm going to put a little bit of flour on my chopping board because I don't want it to stick to the chopping board, although I don't think it will anyway. And I put a little bit of dough on the ball itself. If you hear some noises in the background, it's my one-year-old son. So I do have a capable assistant today, glamorous assistant. She's given me a row for not saying glamorous, so there you are, glamorous assistant behind the camera. And uh, she's managing our one-year-old today. So, um, would you like your first so just bear with us if you hear some funny noises. Yes, I'll take a question. What inspired you to do this sort of thing from Jimmy? What inspired me to do this kind of thing? Um, I have to be honest. Um, I was in Scouts for many, many years. I started when I was a beaver, went all the way through Cubs, Scouts, Adventure Scouts. So I think my first introduction to the outdoors was through Scouts. And at some point during when I was a cub, there was a chap called Ray Mears on the telly a lot. And uh, I think I was doing a lot of camping through Cubs because um, my Cubs were great. We, we did all kinds of camps. And I think at the same time, I was watching the television a little, what, uh, a little bit, watching Ray Mears programmes. And I think it, that's what sort of ignited the spark. It was this idea that you could go camping, but watching Ray Mears gave me a few ideas uh, of where you could take the subject. You know, I didn't know, for example, you could rub sticks together to make fire. And I think that's probably what got me on my journey. Um, and that's probably where I started. So, good question. Um, as I say, I've just, as I've been talking, I've just pressed that into a little bit of a round. So I'm going to just roll this out and I want it to be nice and thin. 
Now remember, this, this dough is nothing fancy. I think sometimes with outdoor cooking, you can get a little bit carried away with the ingredients and you can think, oh, well, you know, I could add this or I could add that. And uh, you don't have to. To keep it really simple, this is literally flour and water. The only other thing I might add to this is a little pinch of salt because I usually add a pinch of salt to just about everything. And in my camping box when I'm outside, I usually have salt, so a little pinch, but that's all. I'm not gonna add anything fancy to that. Okay, so there we are. Now that wrap is nice and thin. I'd say that's about two millimeters. And making it nice and thin is gonna make the difference because we want to try and get some bubbles in this. So I've prepared the wrap, but I'm not gonna cook that yet because I want that to be nice and fresh. So I'm gonna put that to one side and now that I've prepared that, I can cook my sausages. So what I asked you to get, um, if any of you are following, I was posting what you need for these uh, lessons on Instagram. Um, I asked you to get two green sticks about this size, about 10 centimeters wide and about 600 millimeters long. Now, um, I'm going to thread the sausages onto these. Now these are willow, so they're a non-poisonous wood. And, um, Basically, whenever you're cooking with any sticks over the fire, it's important that you get the right wood. Um, so good woods for this, which are nice and safe, nice and non-poisonous, would be willow, hazel, uh, and birch. Those are probably the three most common woods you might find and are nice and safe. You wouldn't want to use yew, which is a very toxic wood. And generally, you wouldn't want to use any woods which have waxy leaves. They can also be a little bit toxic. Things like rhododendron. Um, so just be a little bit careful with your wood choice. Now, they're green because I'm going to use them on the fire and because they're green, they've got water in them. And if they've got water in them, it means they won't burn as quickly. And that's why we want green sticks. Now, I'm also going to take the bark off. Now, when I'm cooking with sticks over a fire. Now, there we are. I've got my always got my first aid kit. Remember when I'm using a knife nice and handy right next to me where I might need it. Check out my other videos on how to uh, what you might put in there. Um, in your first date, but that's very important. I've always got it nice and close. So I'm gonna shave the bark off this stick and just because the bark often has quite a bit of flavor, particularly with something like willow, it's got a bit of a taste. So that's the first reason I might remove the bark. And the second reason is um, once you get down to bare wood, you know that the stick is nice and clean, just about as clean as you can possibly get it um, for a stick. And that's the other reason. So working off to the side of my body, so I've got the knife in my right hand, I'm gonna, Basically, I'm just going to shave the stick down. And again, some of my other videos have got more cutting techniques and safe ways to do this. But I'm, at this stage, I'm just taking the bark off and I'm just shaving it. And again, I'm off to the side of my body. I'm not working in front of myself, uh, in between my legs. This is a bit of a danger area. Um, if I w was sitting down and working in front of myself, I can do that as long as my elbows are on my knees. That's a nice, safe way to do it. But I much prefer... Um, with doing something like this, working off to the side of your body so the knife always travels into space and it's nice and safe. Now, it's Veganuary, so I'm going to cook vegan sausages and these are notorious um, for wanting to break and fall apart a little bit when you thread them onto the stick. They're not as hard as a, not as easy to do this as a meat sausage. So um, I'm gonna try and make this stick nice and thin. So I'm just shaving it down and notice I've got my hand that's supporting um, the piece of wood behind the knife. You would never work towards a hand like this, always away, so it's nice and safe. And I'm just gonna shave this stick down and try and make it nice and uniform. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of a point on it because I want to thread the sausage on. So that's what I've done, I made a stick, but I'm gonna make two of those. And I'll show you why in a minute. So as I'm working on this one, I don't know if we've got any other questions or Favourite wild animal? Mine is a panther. Tom, adventures of Will and Evie. Okay, so your favourite animal is a panther. Um, my favourite animal, it's a good question. I've been asked it quite a few times and I usually say cheetah, but um, I think either a cheetah or I like lynx, Canada lynx, because probably one of my favourite places to visit is the wild Canadian forest and uh, up in Canada, they call lynx the grey ghost because it's a very elusive, 
difficult to find, difficult to see creature. And I've always thought they were quite amazing creatures. They have such huge feet that they can float across the top of the snow without sinking in. They've got almost snowshoes on their own feet. And that's quite amazing. We've got another one here from Cheeky Tim. Um, he or she is asking, what was your scariest moment in Alaska? <laughs> scariest moment in Alaska? Well, I did see a lot of bears and people often ask me, oh, you know, is the scariest thing when you're out there coming across a bear? Uh, and actually, I didn't find it scary at all because although I did make a lot of mistakes on that trip, one thing I did take was local advice on how to behave around bears and how to make sure that you play by the bears rules. So I did that. So I didn't feel particularly that I was ever in a dangerous situation with bears. My scariest um, moment is probably I drank some water that I hadn't boiled um, because I was only 17 and I hadn't really learned how to make water safe to drink and how to uh, collect it and do all of that properly. And I drank some and it made me very sick. Um, and I was out on my own up a river and uh, although I, I was okay, but I was quite ill and I remember thinking, wow, like I've probably taken on a bit more than I could chew. Um, probably bit off a little bit more than I could chew on this trip, but that was probably one of my more scary moments. Okay, so let's get these sausages on. So I've got two sticks. Now I finish with my knife, so I'm gonna put that into, the, uh, into its sheath. Now, I've got a little um, cooking drum here, which is handy, and because these sticks are nice and long, I could just rest them all the way across there. But another neat trick, um, if you don't have a grill or you don't have a griddle and you're cooking outside, you don't have to have a metal griddle. You can use green sticks as a bit of a grill. And all I've done with these sticks is I've got nice thick sticks so they don't burn. And I'm gonna lay them across and I hope you can see that. I did shave one side a tiny little bit flat so they don't roll around on my drum. But all I'm gonna do is place those. And because they're green, that's gonna give me probably an hour before they burn through. Okay, so the reason I've got two sticks is I'm gonna take one of my sausages and I'm gonna thread it down one side and then I'm going to take the other stick and I'm going to thread the sausage down to do it like this. Okay, now, because I'm hungry, I'm going, to, I'm going to have two sausages. So the other one I'm going to thread on. And again, like I said, these are vegan sausages and they're a little bit soft. So you do have to be a little bit careful. That there is a little bit of a variation on how to cook a sausage. You, could, you often see it just stuck right down in one single um, spike. And actually that works quite well, but this is a really nice way to do it because now what I can do, and I hope you can see this, is I can just lay those sticks across there. I'm gonna thread them on just a little bit more just to get the balance right. And I'm just gonna put those on Now, this stick is actually a little bit too long. It's, I have left them, so I'm just gonna gently cut that one. Okay, so I've left those sticks nice and long because now I've got the control. And now that they're resting there, I can do something else. Whereas if you just have one sausage on a stick, you've got to kind of hold the sausage and, and that's fine and it's nice and fun. But uh, doing it this way makes it really simple. So, there's plenty of heat in my fire. Notice again, we don't want flames for, a, for, for when we cook sausages like this. We're, we're basically making almost like a barbecue. And um, you'll see that there, aren't, there isn't much smoke coming off that. And that's because I've let the embers die right down. So while uh, those are cooking and they won't take long, I could maybe take, because I don't want to cook this wrap until the very end, because I'm going to show you another little trick for that. So while I'm waiting, I don't know if there are any other questions, if anybody has any questions, or we could do some shout outs. There's a question here. Do you have any advice to encourage our 13 year old son, Joe, to join Scouts from Maria and Jim? Do I have any advice um, to join Scouts? Well, I, I, love, I love Scouts. I think they're a fantastic organization and I was in Scouts for many, many years. But I would say that all Scout groups aren't created equal. And uh, I think if it's really, if you're wanting um, as much outdoor activity and outdoor time with the um, you know, while your child joins Scouts. I definitely think, you know, ask around at the different Scout groups and see what kind of outdoor activities they do. The Scouts that I was in for many years were fantastic because we did, we always did four camps a year. We always did a winter camp 
Um, we always had a spring, summer and an autumn camp and so we had a lot of camping time. But I know that some scouts don't spend as much time outside and spend more time maybe playing games indoors, which is great and it's all fantastic stuff. But I would definitely say find the right scout group and if you want to encourage your child to go to scouts, I would say, you know, it's difficult. Um, for me, I've always said I think it's important to have heroes and I, I've always had some heroes in my life and I think when I was young and impressionable and I was watching people like Ray Mears on the television and reading books by people like Morris Kahansky who's a really famous woodsman in Canada, all these people really inspired me because these were people that were out doing it all the time and that's what really got me fired up to want to go to scouts and to want to spend more time outside. So I think try to... Um, not influence your child if you're trying to talk them into going to scouts, but certainly providing them with, with as much opportunity to see different people doing these things and maybe create um, a good influence from an outdoor perspective. I guess that's maybe the best advice I would have. Um, Lewis and Max are saying, are asking, our beavers haven't been on for months due to COVID. Are there any other obvious options other than beavers? Well, beavers are fairly young so I, I would say have a look at um, forest schools, forest school options. Um, the other thing I'd say to people is the outdoor industry and the outdoor world is quite a small world. What you find is if you if you ask the forest school leader or somebody who provides forest schools um, who, where they could go and what they could do, maybe you won't be able to do that program that they're providing but they'll probably know somebody else who does outdoor activities for kids um, and you find that word of mouth really helps. I'm just going to turn my sausages because they're cooking really nicely. There we are. They're not going to take long at all. And uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Basically, ask about. It's a small world. When somebody comes to me and says, um, "I want to do, uh, I want to learn how to make a bow and arrow," um, but I'm not running a course at the time, and, and they live too far away, I usually can because I've worked in the industry a long time and I know a lot of people, I can usually point them and say, well, try this guy, check this company out there near you. It's not a very, very big world. Um, things like Outward Bound are another really good place to look. Um, so yeah, I just talk to outdoor leaders, talk to um, national outdoor centres, talk to places like Glenmore Lodge and Plassey Brennan, which are two national outdoor training centres, which do a lot of outdoor activities and just ask about. Um, we've got another one. Would, uh, would love my daughter to join Scouts? But I'm under the impression it's only for boys. Can you clarify? And that's from the deputies. Well, I'm not an expert on Scouts, but I, I'm sure that Scouts changed the rules um, a few years ago now to include um, opportunities for females. And I'm, I'm fairly sure that's the case. Um, it'd be a good question to ask Ed Stafford because he's an ambassador for the Scouts and I'm sure he'll know. But certainly when I was in Scouts, you're right, there wasn't um, as much um, provision for for women in Scouts, for sure, but uh, I think that's changed now. I'm fairly sure that it's much better. Time for a few more? Yeah, a couple more and then I'm going to cook my wrap and eat my breakfast. Okay, hey, Alex Steventon, what is your fire in? Is it an old washing machine drum? <laughs> <laughs> it's not an old washing machine drum. i tell you what it is. Uh, Ed and I filmed a few outdoor bushcraft uh, lessons last year and I made an oven where I bought an old, well it wasn't old, I bought it new actually, it was a dustbin for putting your garden waste in. It was about this tall and it was a metal drum and we used it on the filming. I buried it into a hillside and I made an oven out of it and um, when I brought it home I didn't want to throw it out. I didn't have much use for it because I couldn't build an oven in this garden so I cut the top of it and now we just use it for uh, cooking, over a fam uh, cooking over the fire with the family. So. It's literally just a metal container and I've drilled lots of holes in the side of it because one of the things I'll know, I would tell you about making something like this is if you don't put lots of holes in the side to allow the air to the fire, it will smolder and it won't work well. So plenty of air holes all around the side and you'll, you'll, you'll be able to use something like that for years and years. A couple of people would like to know where you met Ed. I met Ed, um, so part of my job teaching bushcraft and um, being involved in wilderness skills. I sometimes work for TV production companies and I give the production company who's making the program a little bit of advice on safety, bushcraft, survival skills, going to remote places and uh, giving them some advice on what kind of bushcraft you can do there. And I met him on um, a show that the production company employed me to do um, behind the scenes basically, um, helping make that show run smoothly. That's where I met Ed and we've been friends ever since. Um, One more question and then I'm going to cook my wrap. I'll have to ask this one. Mr Sherlock would like to know yeah. what is a good indoor bushcraft activity to do with kids? 
A good indoor bushcraft activity to do with kids. Well, some of the ones we've done already, some of the videos we've done, um, there's lots of things you can do. You can do um, carving, for example. If you look at last Tuesday's um, session where I showed you how to safely carve a tent peg, um, that's something that can be done completely indoors. Um, so that's a really good one. I'd say things like studying natural history and um, looking at plants and trees and leaves and trying to learn a little bit about nature. That's something you can easily do inside. Um, obviously things like cooking and fires and things like that you wouldn't want to light inside. Um, and then other little projects which we might get round to in this series would be things like weaving. So finding some natural materials and being able to weave really simple projects. So hopefully we'll get time to show you all those. But there's plenty of things you can do. Um, inside with children. Right, I need to cook my wrap because my sausages are ready. So what I'm going to do is, you'll notice I don't, I've got a lot of heat coming from that because I've got coals, but to cook my wrap, I want to have a really hot fire because the way to get bubbles in the wrap is lots and lots of heat. So here's a little trick for you. Small sticks will create a lot of flame and a lot of heat. They'll burn quickly, but they'll give you lots of heat and all the heat that you're going to need to cook. So I've prepared a few small sticks and I'm going to add those to my fire now because I want to get lots and lots of heat. So something I learned many years ago in bushcraft is um, small sticks for boiling, large sticks for broiling. Now broiling is an old word for grilling. And basically what that means is small sticks for boiling, that's going to give you lots of heat, lots of flame really quickly and large sticks for broiling where you want a slow, gentle heat um, and that's what I added to get my coals. So that's a really good tip for you. So I've put some small sticks on there and then I've got my pan. So I've got a um, great pan for cooking outside. This is just a simple pancake pan um, and it's all metal and it's, um, it's really perfect for this. But if you didn't have a pan like this, you could use a um, heavy bottomed cast iron frying pan or even a steel skillet, anything like that. It's got to be something you're prepared to put on the fire. Um, be a little bit careful with things like non-stick non pans on the fire because you'll um, sometimes the flames will lick round and start to damage the coating. So something that's just steel or um, cast iron is perfect. So I want to get this pan really hot. Now, it's not going to take long to cook this at all. And because this might get quite hot, really good well, my son is stuffing things into gloves at the moment all the time, so there we are, found a few interesting items in there. A nice solid um, leather glove to be able to protect your hands. Now, you can see that's smoking quite a lot, and I don't want smoke, I want heat, so I'm just going to blow on that a little bit, and that's going to hopefully burst into flames. And there we are, as if by magic. So by blowing on the fire, I give it a lot of oxygen, move my sausages off to one side because they're cooked now and I don't want to burn them. But give the fire a lot of oxygen and then the small sticks are going to burst right up into flame. So pan goes on, I want to get that nice and hot, that's why I've added the small sticks. Now while that's getting hot, I did brush a little bit of oil on the pan, it's not essential if you've got a really well seasoned pan but a little bit of oil just really helps. I've got my tomato sauce because you can't have a breakfast wrap without tomato sauce ready to go. I just need that to get nice and hot. Sausages are just keeping warm just to the side, that's perfect. pan's had one to two minutes, just getting nice and hot. Then my wrap, which I've made, oh, a pretty good size. I put my glove on for holding the pan. I've got my spatula ready. Now it's not going to take long to cook this, it's only going to take about a minute a minute and a half, not much longer than that. And what I'm looking for, if the pan's hot enough, I should see some bubbles start to appear. 
Now remember, these are really simple. The nice thing with these, you could make a bunch of them and you cook them really fresh and really easy. I'm just gonna keep checking the underside of it to make sure that it's not burning, but it isn't. It's just starting to cook and I'm getting a few bubbles. That tells me that my pans, you can see, I don't know if you'll be able to see that on the camera, but a few bubbles. And then once it's had, I don't know, 45 seconds, I'm just gonna use my spatula to turn it over. Now a little tip, if you want more bubbles, you can, use your spatula to just push down on the uh, surface of it and you'll see that it almost peels away in layers it's strange and it creates more bubbles and you'll see that as I do that it's really doing that now that's just starting to brown look at that big bubble that's perfect I'm going to turn it over once more for the final cooking and you can see that puff up there And I don't want to cook it much more than that because I don't want it to be dry. And there we are. That, and I can take my uh, pan off now, which is going to be very hot. So obviously put that somewhere nice and safe. And there you can see I've got a lovely soft tortilla. With lots of lovely bubbles, little burny bits. It's just absolutely perfect. And that, I can then take my sausages put them onto my wrap. And if I had more time, I probably would have made an egg and thrown it in there, but I didn't want to overcomplicate anything for anyone. So now I'm going to put a little bit of tomato sauce on there. And then I can fold it up. And there we have my breakfast wrap cooked entirely on the fire. I'll take those green sticks off. Okay. Mm. Very nice. So, I hope that was helpful. I hope that was useful. Definitely encourage you to get outside and try cooking on the fire. It takes a little bit longer and there's a little bit of setup, but there's nothing quite like cooking outside on a fire. So I don't know if there are any questions or comments or shout outs. Um, I won't eat another mouthful of this because I'm gonna to have to answer a question, but it's very nice. Um, Cha Charlie Cordy has asked a few times if you've ever been in the Arctic. Have I been in the Arctic? Yes, I've been in the Arctic. Yep, yep, fantastic place. Probably my most favorite environment is the subarctic actually, which is just one below the Arctic in the biomes. What I like about the subarctic is it's cold and snowy, but there's lots of trees. And if you have trees, you have much more possibilities for bushcraft and comfort. And there's usually much more wildlife there too. So I do like the subarctic. Um, another question, what is your favorite thing you've cooked or made? And that's from Samuel Marshall. Favorite thing I've cooked. Um, I guess one of my favorite things to do outside is actually to cook underground. So to dig a big hole, heat up some rocks and cook food in there. And that's quite a long involved process. But what I like about that is it is quite a lot of work, but it's great for cooking with a group because everybody can get involved. Um, there's lots of, lots of jobs for everybody to do. Everybody um, is involved in the process. And then at the, end of the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of the evening, when you, un you dig all the food out of the ground where it's been cooking in there for hours and everybody has a bit of a feast. And it's just an amazing thing to do. It's probably my favorite cooking outside to do. Damien is asking, or saying, you've got to share that with the wifey, and I was just about to ask where mine was. Yes, I will. <laughs> I will. I'm deliberately not eating too much of it, because, <laughs> although I want to, I don't want to speak with my mouth full. Okay, here's a question. Couple more questions? Yeah. What is the best place yeah. to get information about where to work camp in the UK? So that's a really common question I get asked all the time. Where can I do this kind of stuff, and where can I wild camp in the UK? And my advice is usually, again, talk to people who do this kind of thing. So <clears throat> talk to the scouts, find out where their um, pieces of land they use for going camping. Um, certainly in Edinburgh, where I grew up, it's a really big area just on the outskirts of Edinburgh that the scouts use um, all the time for wild camping and, and, and doing bushcraft outside and, and all that kind of stuff. So talk to them, find out what pieces of land they have. They might let you either join in or just even pointing you in the right direction of a piece of land you might be able to use. Um, 
talk to outdoor schools, talk to people who do this kind of stuff, talk to forest schools, people. Um, you tend to find, again, I'll say that the people in the outdoor industry, the people that are doing these kinds of, kinds of things, A, tend to be really nice people, and you can ask them a question about where they do this kind of stuff, and B, there tends to be a, a network, and they, if they can't help you out, they'll point you to somebody else. And then also, just find a piece of land. If there's a little bit of woodland and you've often wondered uh, who owns it, just ask around in the local village or town and just say, do you know who owns that land? And nine times out of 10, it'll be some farmer. And if they're friendly, you can just ask them and say, look, do you mind if I um, camp overnight in your woods? I'll do it very um, sustainably and I'll do it very um, sensitively. And uh, don't be afraid to actually pay for a bit of overnight camping. That's another thing I often say to people. Don't expect to be able to use somebody's land for free. Much better if you just say to someone, you know, I'll give you 10 pounds per person per night or something like that. <coughs> or even a bottle of whiskey or a couple of cans of beer, just something um, to show that you value the fact they're going to allow you to do it. And I tend most people uh, to find most people have good uh, success doing that kind of thing. And I'm gonna do a couple of shout outs and then I'm gonna sign off and allow you to cook your breakfast and I'm gonna eat mine because it's still warm. Although I'm enjoying the heat of it uh, in my hands. So Jonathan Woodward, loving these light, loving these lives, lives. <coughs> Excuse me. Watching with my son Samson, age seven, it would be it would make his day if you gave him a shout out. He's got his first bushcraft knife for Christmas. Well, there you are, Samson, age seven. I've had an amazing twenty years in bushcraft, so I really hope that you're getting um, starting on the same journey as 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 I have. Um, there's so much to learn and so much to enjoy. So good good luck to you. Um, can William have a shout out? Um, Adventures of Will and Evie, can I have a shout out please? Yes. Can Thomas have a shout out? Hello. Yep, you can have a shout out Thomas. Hello to you. Uh, hi from Adam. Hi Adam. Nicely done Steve, thank you very much. Again I'm still enjoying the heat from my wrap here but I'm looking forward to eating it. Um, hi to William. The Forest School of Horsham. Pupils loving it. Well great, glad to hear that you guys are getting out and doing some bushcraft. Um, and hello from uh, Hazley from Namibia. Wow, one of my favorite countries in the world, Namibia. Um, I've been there on a few trips, um, flying to Windhoek and then travel up to Bushman land in the northeast corner. Wonderful place, wonderful people. I love Namibia. Okay, and then please shout out to For the Youth. Hi, For the Youth. Hello to you, hope you're enjoying cooking outside. And the last one, seven-year-old Leave. I think it says, from Aberdeenshire. Leave, leave, hi to you. Not quite sure how to pronounce your name, but hello to you. And love Namibia, yes, so do I. Well, thanks very much for watching and uh, I'm gonna enjoy my sandwich, my breakfast wrap, and uh, join Ed on Wednesday uh, for a little bit more bushcraft, 10 o'clock on YouTube channel. Thanks very much. There we are.